Okay, thank you, Julie. And so, uh, as some of you may or may not know, I'm actually broadcasting from the UK, but um, I did live in Australia for many years, 25 years. We just recently moved back to the UK. I don't know if we have anybody with us from the UK today. I think everybody's pretty much from Australia, so that's fine. So we'll get started. So we haven't got very long, um, so I'll be whipping through these pretty quickly. But don't worry, there's lots of ways you can keep in touch afterwards, find out more if you don't actually know much about what we do to start with. Um, so just very briefly, um, my background is um, I've got a master's in equine science. Um, I did teach equine science for quite a few years at the University of Melbourne. But we, Stuart and myself, we run a business called Equiculture, and we concentrate on teaching people about sustainable horse management. And we did go, we did get um, a Winston Churchill Fellowship a few years ago while we lived in Australia, looking at this subject in the USA and Canada as well, because we've done quite a bit of work over here now in the UK. But we specialise in the subject of grazing behaviour and how you can set up your property. Um, to suit horses, um, taking into account their natural behaviour. So, what should a horse property look like? So today I'm going to be very briefly talking about, as I said, um, you know, what, how we should make it more horse friendly. So this is sort of sort of typical of what many humans might think a horse property should look like. This is for some people, this would be their dream horse property. Whereas for horses, um, their, their dream horse property would look more like this. In fact, it wouldn't even have the fence there, obviously. It would just be pasture, um, some trees for shade, water, and basically that's all they want to need, and obviously companions. Um, so we have, to, we have to make compromises, but what we should be trying to do is make it suit them as much as possible, the horses in the domestic situation. Um, we need to keep various things in mind about horses for instance free living horses always live in herds they never live alone by choice ever they, they simply wouldn't do that and if they do if they did they don't survive very long um either uh, not so much predated on these days but in the past that's what would have happened plus um then they can't relax enough to sleep properly if they live alone and we need to remember that equines in the wild live in a home range. Now, this actually suits us when keeping horses in a domestic situation. What a home range is, is an area where all their resources are available and they move between those resources on a daily basis. So they move from the grazing areas to the watering area, um, you know, the, uh, the, the um, river or whatever, uh, to shade and shelter and so on. They don't migrate across the country like um, many other large grazing herbivores actually live in a home range. So this is actually a good thing because it means that in a domestic situation, we can actually replicate that quite easily once we know how to do it, which I'll be talking a little bit about today. Um, domestic horses are managed by humans for better or for worse. Often, not they're, they're often in conditions that are not actually that good. So they're often kept in very small areas. Um, and we need to keep in mind that traditional based management systems don't take into account their natural behaviours at all, pretty much. So, for instance, we separate horses um, and keep them in very small cages, if you like. They're often, they often have no choice but to graze badly managed overgrazed paddocks. I'm not going into um, pasture management today, particularly. Um, we're talking more about housing and, and property development. But we need to keep these facts about horses in mind when designing a horse property so that we don't end up building expensive unnecessary facilities we do see this all the time when we consult on properties people have often if we don't get there in time they've often spent far too much money on the wrong things basically and once you actually know what's important to a horse and fully understand that then you can actually save yourself a lot of money so it's easy to get carried away and plan to build facilities that suit you but don't necessarily suit the needs of horses Remember that if you try to force horses to behave a certain way, they'll, they'll simply still do their best to be um, a horse. So in, they'll, they'll walk the fence lines and so on. Also remember that when we start to feed horses on supplementary feed, which we have to do in a domestic situation sooner or later, we actually start to change their behavior because what happens is they actually start to, to spend more time looking for the food to be brought to them than going off and grazing. And it, again, this can actually work to our benefit once we understand what's happening and how we can do that. But this hanging around, this standing around the gate behavior looking for feed 
actually creates land degradation problems. So um, it's also dangerous in this case, we've got three separated horses interacting with each other over fences and gates. It's actually very dangerous behaviour. Those horses can actually injure themselves much more so than usually when they're kept together. So we should avoid horses playing over a fence at all costs. Horse fences are probably the most, fences and gates are probably the most dangerous part of a horse property for horses. Um, if, if you think about it, you will all know of horses that have badly injured themselves, sometimes fatally, on fences and gates. They're so dangerous to horses. So we should always avoid that. As, as our preference would be, just keep them together. If not, then if you must keep them apart, then there should be double fences. They should not be allowed to interact over a fence, which is too dangerous. So just on fence walking again, it causes expensive and extensive damage to your land. The picture on the bottom right there, that was just done in a matter of um, a couple of days in a, on a dry property near Canberra, I think that picture was taken, sandy soil. So the damage you know, is rapid, um, especially in certain soil types. Once that damage is done, it has to be undone. So we need to remember that horses have a need to spend a certain amount of time carrying out certain behaviours. So loafing, well, I'll start with grazing, around 12 to 16 hours a day is normal. 20 hours is only in very extreme conditions when they have to extend their grazing or browsing time, um, such as in extreme drought or in winter. Um, sleeping around four hours a day for a mature horse. And loafing is everything else they do with their day. And again, it's on average around four hours a day. So that's standing around together, playing, um, snoozing, that sort of thing together. But what's really important is to remember that grazing and walking are linked behaviours. So when horses are grazing, they're also walking. So keep that in mind. Um, another way of looking at that is if you have them in a bare area, if you have them in an area where there is no grass, they won't walk around just for the sake of it. They might run around for a few minutes to run off excess energy but then they'll switch to standing still. And that's where you get that standing around the gate behavior. So we need to think about how we can encourage movement. So it needs to be natural movement instead of unnatural. So it needs to be, yes, running around and playing or walking while grazing rather than walking in the fence line. That's not good exercise, that's stereotypic behavior. It's causing a lot of problems, not just for the land, but it's not good for them either, the twisting um, where they spin around, walk backwards and forwards, that sort of thing, it's not good uh, behaviour at all. So we must get the balance right when we're designing a horse property. We've got three sets of factors roughly, you group everything pretty much into these three sets of factors. We've got the human factors such as how much money we have, how much easy it's going to be to use and so on. We have the equine factors such as their behaviour and welfare and we have the environmental factors which I haven't even really mentioned yet. Um, such as soil or soil loss, reducing soil loss or preventing it altogether, pasture, providing land for wildlife, keeping the waterways clean, all these really important factors as well, which is what we talk about extensively in our bigger talks. So generally speaking on many horse properties, this is it, it's a very unbalanced um, situation. We have the human factors tend to take precedence, and this is because Historically, we've kept horses as a work animal, so it's not surprising that this is, is this is how it is. It's not surprising at all. Whereas, in fact, what we actually need is all three sets of factors to be completely in balance, because if they aren't, something further down the line will, will give way. So, for instance, you could come up with something, uh, for instance, that's perfect for the environment, but if it costs too much to implement and it doesn't suit equine wealth, their welfare and behaviour, it's not going to work in the long run. So I'm sure you can also think of, you know, in each case, um, that is true. All these three groups of factors need to be in balance. So remember, you need to plan how you can reduce your herds to one if possible. In this picture here, we've got three racehorses who are currently racing when this picture was taken. So if they can do it, then most horses can do it. It's just resistance um, on the part of many horse owners to put horses together. And I do know that there are some horses who can't group together, but on the whole, most horses can be. And it makes a huge difference to land management and to building your facilities, um, having them together. Remember that you need to plan to implement grazing systems. This makes a big difference to how you lay out your property. So basically, um, set stocking, which isn't desirable. I'll just mention a bit more about that in a minute. 
But rotational grazing, this is what every horse property should have in place. It means that the land is in use some of the time and rested the rest of the time. And this means that the grasses get to rest and recuperate and live to see another day, basically. And then there's other grazing systems, which, which I won't go into at all to, in this talk, uh, which you can find out more um, by staying in touch with us. We have a fantastic um, Facebook group called Echo Central Central, uh, good website and so on. So there's lots of ways that you can find out more about these things if you're interested. But set stocking basically means that when a property is set out like this, which is very typical these days for setting out horse properties, it might look like this uh, right at the beginning, but it's an absolute disaster for land management because in no time at all, due to horse behaviour, this is what it will look like. You'll end up with um, without lots of pasture management, which is very difficult in very small areas. You'll end up with lots of roofs and lawns, but you'll also end up with lots of hanging around the gate behaviour. So you'll have, you'll have lots of bare soil or muddy soil or whatever, and it takes an awful lot of management for a horse property to not end up like looking like this very quickly. So this is what you'll typically see on a lot of in a distant or livery yards when the horses are kept um, separately. You should plan to have good graze man grazing management, as I men mentioned. So good grazing management benefits both the environment and your horse. You should aim to keep good ground cover on your land. This protects your soil, reduces weeds and feeds your horses. Actually saves a huge amount of money having good grazing management. It's so not cost, you know, just not cost effective to have your horses wear out the land and then you have to buy all your feeding. And again, this is what we talk about in great detail normally. Um, so, as I said, to do this, you should aim to, uh, aim to allow each paddock have to, to have time to rest and recuperate. And for this reason, you should have no more than 30% of your pasture being used at any one time. And this is quite possible when you group your horses and have a rotational grazing system in place. And very, very briefly, the reason rotational grazing works is because in the wild, that is what is the, the rotational grazing in a domestic situation is the closest we can come to replicating what happens in the wild, where animals move across the landscape, putting large amounts of pressure on the land for, for short periods of time, very short periods of time, and then moving on to another grazing area. That's what happens in the wild situation. This is what this is how grasses have evolved to thrive. And so we need to try and copy that. Just like humans and other animals, horses are part of an ecosystem on your property. So thinking of them in that way completely changes how you manage the property. So as well as providing a home for your horses, you're also planning to provide habitat for wildlife, which many of which in turn do you a favour by doing things like um, controlling pest insects and so on. Remember, you're now a grass farmer. By thinking of yourself as a grass farmer, you'll be able to maximise how long your horses are able to spend doing what they love, which is grazing. So, but very quickly on to property planning. I'm just going to very briefly talk about the Ecocentral system, which is a system that we developed and now advocate, and we've been doing so for many years now. Um, but it's a system of management for the 21st century because it combines the natural and domesticated behaviour of horses, good land management practices, including rotation grazing, and it creates a healthy and sustainable environment for your horses and your land and the wider environment all at the same time. So very briefly, it involves having an area to hold your horses, a surfaced area, and the horses can either come and go night and day, or for instance, they could be passenger through the night, and you could just turn them out through the day. But notice the water is only in the holding area. It's not in the other areas. Uh, it's not in the paddocks, for instance. So in the morning, for instance, right before you set up for work, you would just open the gate if the horses have been in overnight, take themselves out for a grazing bout, which typically lasts around three hours. They bring themselves back to love involuntarily in the shade and shelter. Maybe eat hay if you have some in there as well, which is always a good idea, drink the water and so on. Then they take themselves back out for a second grazing bout and then they bring themselves back around uh, just before you're doing home from work and stand watching you arrive home. Um, so that's very briefly how the ecocentric system works. So there's lots of advantages. So it saves on the costs of individual shelters in the various paddocks. It means that you're spending money on one set of facilities and they're in use all day, every day. The horses have to move more like they do in a home range. It vastly reduces the grazing pressure without stressing the horses because you're not making them do anything. The horses come to you, it saves you having to go to them. 
it's safer in fire and flood because the yard arena is also fire break but also the horses can get themselves to high dry areas or safer areas in, in those um, emergency situations no horses staring around in gateways wearing out the um, soil less manure drops in the paddock so if you're picking up manure it's easy to collect safer if hendra virus is a risk in your area as it is in um, parts of new south wales and queensland um hay sped in the yards rather than in paddocks so it's easy to manage any weeds that might be in that hay the horses come into you for feed you don't have to cart it around the property to them it's safer if less experienced people have to handle your horses um and as i said horses don't have to stand around in muddy conditions developing skin conditions such as grease to heal or mud fever negates the problem of where to put the water of strip grazing but most of all the horses are now able to decide where they want to be and are able to take themselves there this is a big deal for a horse when you think that in the domestic situation horses are usually um that every step they take is dictated by a human um and so this means that horses as a group can make decisions about moving around the property so in effect you are creating a home range for your horses with all the resources freely available and they're able to make decisions about when they access them and when so when it comes to paddocks on your property, lots of small paddocks equals more expense, more fence, fence injuries and more maintenance. But we do need to create at least three paddocks for efficient rotation. Remember the 30% rule. Use electric fences to create extra paddocks. So you can have larger paddocks and just use electric fencing to subdivide them. That will save you a lot of money. Wet areas and dry areas should always be separated on a property. And again, electric fencing is ideal for that. And always avoid acute corners in paddocks, especially when you're grouping horses so that if they do gallop round, they'll be moved around the corners rather than into them. As I said, consider an equicentral system. Fence on the contours whenever possible. So if that again electric fencing is ideal for this because it's not hard to change direction with electric fencing. You can have curves in fencing. Because if you don't fence in the right places, you'll get this kind of thing happening where animals are uh, being forced to move in a certain direction and then they create um, all sorts of land degradation problems. Living fences are the best fences of all. Um, so in this case for a horse though eating through the fence because it, in this case it needs an electric, an internal electric fence too to stop the horse pushing through the fence. Um, this is just an example. This property uh, was a property in, in, is a property in Canberra approximately 15 acres again it has an equicentral system set up so we've got a horse yard there um, and we've got all the paddocks leading into either directly leading into the horse yard or the, the surface holding yard in the way of putting it or into a laneway that then leads them up to the horse yard so we've got permanent fencing around the outside but the internal fencing is all electric and then we've also got lots of vegetation between the paddocks as well so that's a really really good setup um, and that makes a huge difference to how much grass they produce, how clean the water is, how happy the horses are and so on. And very, very easy to set up. In this property here, we've got a much larger property. I think this property was around 100 acres and it, ha it has cattle as well as horses. So in this case, on the left here, we've got mainly the horse area, which is nearer the house. Um, and, um, and they're all again leading into a central point for the horses but then they also did a similar thing with the cattle so on the right of the property here on the right of their driveway we've got cattle but the good thing about that is they can also use the cattle to, for the advantages of um, cross grazing so they can let the they can let each set of animals swap from time to time um, onto the other part of the property to get the advantages of cross grazing, which I haven't got time to go into in this talk. Um, an example of another larger property, this time a big stub, uh, where the youngsters have their own central point down at this end here. Um, so they, they have a central area there. The mares and foals are kept at the front of the property here. But when they want to uh, bring the youngsters up, all they have to do is fasten the mares into one of these paddocks from the youngsters up the, up the driveway, up the laneway, up to the, um, the the main central point of here for ease of use. So again, it's made a huge difference. Rather than having to lead in lots of one and two year olds up a laneway, they now just run them all. They bring up the gate and they bring themselves in. Same with the mares and foals, constantly bringing themselves in, puts down and work enormously. 
Um, so another thing to think about is, as much as possible, try to minimise laneways on a horse property because um, sometimes, it, as in the previous uh, diagonal of this picture, we, we had the, lane, the paddocks leading off from here. That's the best arrangement if you can um, achieve it. But if not, you can use a laneway, but you need to minimise laneways if, if possible. So you, you know, you're better off having the paddocks lit, uh, planning out from the central yard if you can. It does depend on how hilly your land is. The flatter land, if your land is flatter, it should result in less laneways. Less fencing, less laneways, sorry, means less fencing, less surfacing and the potential for more pasture. So aim to minimise them if possible. If you already have water in each paddock, this can be turned off when the horses are using a paddock and turned on again if and when other grazing animals such as cows or sheep are using the paddock. So don't despair if you already set water up in the paddock. Avoid having any, any uh, dead ends on laneways. So in this case here, a laneway that ends would have ended in the square. Because it now ends in, in, a, in a round shape, the horses can at least move around that. But ideally, there should always be one of those gates open into a paddock rather than having a dead end on the lane there. So again, because horses get galloping fast, it can be very dangerous. Um, but yeah, if they're quiet and older animals, then it could occasionally be used as a turnout area, but it would need surface on it. And this is the problem with laneways. They require surfacing, so they're very expensive to have. The width of a laneway depends on the number of horses and whether they'll be traverse, transverse, traverse it as a herd or individually. Um, so but as a minimum, it should be wide enough for a fire truck, but preferably wider. The surface will depend on the soil type, how much the loam is used, etc. You might only need to surface certain parts, such as the low lying areas where it might go to a wetter area. Can it be dual purpose? This 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 uh, large area in America that we visited had laneways between all the paddocks that they used to drive, as well as using to get the horses out to the paddocks. They also used to drive or ride the horses around. Aim to design your property, as I said, so that you minimise rain laneways, so that um, and you've got more area for potential grazing. A holding yard can be large enough for a group of horses, so it's better if it is. Um, if the facilities are shared, then you're going to be saving a lot of money. Rounded corners are a good idea in any areas that horses are grouped together, but a minimum of 50 square metres per horse is generally needed, um, although the horses will spend most of their time congregating together in the shade and where any hay is fed. In this, in this picture here, we've actually got quite a large yard, but again, the horses spend most of their time standing in that one spot because that's where the shade is, um, but, it, but the, it's still, the space is still there if they need it. But that surface area doesn't usually have to be that big, especially for two horses. Shelters, if, um, if you've got horses separated, you need to um, think about the best place to put them. In this case here, these shelters have been completely wasted. The horses are standing where they are so that they can stand together, but also so that they can see meals on wheels coming down the hill. They're not going to stand back in these shelters here. They want to stand by the gate. So you need to keep these things in mind. Shelters can be a complete waste of money. Again, if, they, if those horses were kept together, one communal shelter would make much more horse sense. If you do have to separate horses, again, this sort of arrangement would be better because the horses, when they would be able to stand next to each other, more or less, and stand and use the shelter at the same time, or the, or the, the, the small yard in this case, and all that would take lots of pressure of the very small amount of land that's available per horse, but it would mean that you would be maximising um, the amount of grass that you could produce. Again, similar arrangement um, in this case with the laneway going up the middle for feeding, but the horses are able to stand very close to each other in this adjustment situation. Gateways, many injuries happen to horses in, in gateways. There was once a study done showing that the most dangerous um, area on a horse property, that in fences. Um, gateways should always be placed in, in a, a place in an area that's logical for the horse. So, for instance, this gateway here is too far back. The horses will stand here because they want them to go into the yard area. Um, so that gateway needs to be where they can just um, flow out of the paddock and into the yard. Horses struggle with moving in the wrong direction to go towards where somewhere that they want to be. So yeah, keep them in a logical place. This I'm just showing you a couple of examples now, and then we've finished. Um, this property here, this 
it's actually in the UK, but here on the left, you can't see it. We've got a stable yard, but with a perfectly good concreted yard. Um, but the horses are fastened in the paddock, creating all this mud and land degradation. All that needs to happen here is that gate should be open. The horses could then bring themselves onto this area and stand. They would do all their hanging around behaviour there rather than creating more mud in the paddock. This property here um, is in a, uh, it's actually a livery place in the UK, but again, just a really good example of um, they were going to build stables, but instead they built these lovely big um, running sheds, but they can also be subdivided into stables if they like by just closing the gates off. Um, so again, it's a central area that the horses can bring themselves to, but um, it can also be used for individual stabling, tacking up, feeding supplementary feed and so on. Really, really good resource. This property here, lovely open shed, um, shelter and on a, a nice central yard that has lots of different facilities, on, lots of different surfaces on it. I think the picture of that next picture, yes, it does. Um, pea gravel, sand, um, different types of gravel and so on. So that's, um, yeah, really, really good yard. And the horses voluntarily spend hours and hours a day on this, um, this yard. Okay, so that's it for this talk. Um, make sure you join the mailing list on equiculture.net. Um, straight away then you'll get a free article about the Ecocentral system which we'll go into a lot more detail than what I've just talked about. And yes, so that's it for now. So any questions, just fire away.